Hello, hello everyone. How are you doing? My name is Jason Wade. I'm here uh, at our academy, as you know, um, with James Gordon. And uh, we're going to do some physical descriptions, then we're going to do an intro of James, and then we're going to dive right into our topic, um, which I think we're just calling the future. <laughs> um, so uh, I am a white individual with blonde bleached hair on top of my head and shaved sides. I'm wearing a black top with um, a flannel that's black and red on top of that. And the walls behind me are quite bare, it's just a white white wall <laughs> and a door. Um, James, would you mind doing a physical description and then we'll ask you a few questions to get started? Okay, sure. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm a white guy, um, in my late 40s. Um, uh, so I'm wearing a gray t-shirt um, and the wall behind me is lime green. <laughs> All right. And so, um, so yeah, we'll just start with who are you? <laughs> yeah. Who are you? What do you do? Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, so, um, my sort of first real encounter with, with the world of autism, shall we say, um, came when, uh, I, I sort of became a single parent of a baby boy um, and um, I was bringing him up. Um, as he was growing up, he very early on, he wasn't developing properly. So um, there was a lot of sort of tests done and things like that. And um, he had learning disabilities diagnosed, but he also had an autism diagnosis after that. Um, and as I encountered various professionals, um, get encouraging him to walk and everything like that, um, uh, they became, they were pointing out that I was communicating without words to him, uh, in a way that they couldn't. Uh, so that got me thinking and after a lot of different professionals, you know, repeated these kind of things. Um, I realized that I was um, instinctively understanding what my son was doing because I'd done most of the same things, although I could, I uh, developed speech and he hasn't. Um, we, we are very much the same. Uh, in fact, I can even remember when I was about, I remember... Um, when I was very young, uh, I was speech delayed and I spoke late. Um, so it's kind of led me to um, a late, un late understanding that I'm autistic uh, late in life, in my 40s. Um, and, you know, it's, it's brought back a lot of memories and, and it's made me understand the stigma that existed in the 70s and 80s when I was growing up and um, that it wasn't spoken about, uh, it wasn't even an understood word, um, yeah. certainly by the public. But then uh, as I've got into the world of advocacy and uh, through, um, so uh, when I was um, starting off as a parent, I was looking around Facebook for, um, and I found that there were groups on there um, and found a group for London uh, that just had London Autism Group on it. I joined, there was about 50 members and uh, I started posting immediately because um, a lot of the things that problems that other people were having, I'd encountered and I could help them. And uh, so uh, Chris, the, the guy who, who created the group and admin it, um, contacted me and uh, we had a chat and he made me an admin as well. And that was about nine years ago. Um, and we've been helping out the London autistic community ever since really. Um, so uh, the, the group really sort of blew up in numbers. Um, 
and but we, we kept sort of seeing repeating themes where the same kind of problems are coming up as as came up at the, at the start where there's real lack of support it'll be these won't be big news to any of, of you but <laughs> you know the lack of support and everything and we were trying to signpost to be the big organizations and there just wasn't the support from them that we need um, and and unfortunately that's sort of still the case so we decided a few years ago um even though it's going to be a, a very long um task we decided to form our own charity and try and achieve some of these things ourselves yeah it's a <clears throat> amiable or admirable that's the word i wanted <laughs> admirable effort um before we move too far down the discussion line yeah. um i do want to just touch on some normal questions that we ask in the yeah. beginning of these sessions so um what are your dedicated interests or specializations um and well you already actually answered the other question which is when did you discover you were autistic so that worked out yeah. nicely um but yeah do you have uh some dedicated interests right now outside of the work that you do uh a, a lot of a lot of it's sort of intertwining i mean uh because i come I remember the time before the internet and before, you know, there was access to like a lot of, you know, media and, and things like yeah. that. So uh, I still have a fondness for books and mm. things like that. Um, uh, and I've really discovered that um, I I tend to find comfort in um, repetition of of my favorite things you know my favorite books or my favorite movies yeah. um so i'm constantly about 10 years behind the rest of the world in uh which which is uh, i'm not sort of up to date with with which is the current series on tv or the current films in the cinema i'm uh sort of using using that as a you know that repetition as a kind of comfort for myself a lot of the time yeah um there's absolutely nothing wrong with that yeah. <laughs> i feel you <laughs> i'm kind of in the same boat um awesome so okay well i would love to just dive into what you have to present for us today i did you you, you did work out how to present um uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna try and share my screen okay and see if that works Um, yeah, this one, that's right. Um, so can you see that? Yes. Although it's, um, it's going to be small at first, yeah. but I just wanted to show the scale. It, it's, it's, um, so this is, um, uh, by the way, I, I'm only an expert by experience and, uh, trial and error and this kind of thing um i'll tell you a quote um that i my first I, I went back to the first message the first conversation that i had with chris um who's who's our charity lead now um and he said uh, will you come and help out and add me in the facebook group and i said um i will come along uh that's fine but just until you find somebody better <laughs> yeah so and he just never really <laughs> he never found, found anybody and it and i've got that sense of even being here with you on, on academy uh i've got that kind of imposter syndrome that i think a lot of people probably have as well that um so these are just things <laughs> the, the, these are just things um that i've put i, I thought that we needed um and I've just put them into a diagram and they've become the goals of the charity. Awesome. Um, so okay. this um, trustee of London autism group charity, that is the charity we're talking about. Yeah. 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 Okay. So uh, we, that for folks we, we, we serve quite a big area. It's, it's the whole of London and surrounding counties. Wow. wow. Um, although we are very small in number. Uh, so and we're most, 
we're uh, Chris and I don't take a salary. Uh, we're entirely non-profit, um, and we, we've got a small team of volunteers, um, and we're trying to grow that at the moment. So, um, so how the diagram works? It's called a theory of change, and um, most organisations like charities have them um, just as a guide to what their ultimate goals will be. Um, this is the title. It's a generational sh shift to transform autism understanding in society. Um, and then what you do, you start at the bottom of the pyramid and we, we're sort of putting things in and seeing what comes out and um, so these things in the arrows are what we're putting in and i'll probably have to zoom in <laughs> even more and probably zoom in more and more and more um let's go i i chose this um adobe acrobat because you can really zoom in far yeah it'll probably take a long time to load the image i once had this printed out on a poster um and it took a long time to find a way of doing that because um it is zoom you have to zoom in pretty far before you get anything right you can i think you'll be able to see that maybe yes it's um okay it's still on the smaller end but i think if you read it out it's not can, as i can zoom in more <laughs> let's see if that works <laughs> see what happens that should do um, it that does it, yeah. Let's see what happens. Um, okay. okay, so... So what we have is we're putting... We, we're sort of putting things in and, and then seeing what the outcomes are at each stage. Um, so we basically built, we're building the charity from the ground up. So it will take a long time to get to the realms of the big charities of nowadays, because they've been around for over 60 years, Right. you know? So, um, uh, so, um, one thing that struck us straight away was, uh, that we need, um, intensive autism training that's autistic led um to transform the public services um so um wherever you are if you know if if you're in a hospital if you're in a gp surgery um if you're in schools if you're out and about and and you have come in contact with the police um if you're applying for a job if you're going to apply for benefits or uh, also we want to train the media because I think um, a lot of their handling of autism leaves a lot to be desired right. <laughs> as, yeah. as far as the uh, autistic advocacy community goes. Um, uh, and then um, one thing, um, one of our main goals is to have support for autistic people at every stage of their life because mm -hmm. at the moment um everyone is concentrating on kids and 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 that in itself is is rooted in an outdated concept where they're trying to change autistic kids into yeah. neurotypicals you know or at least to conform to neuro neuronormative standards and we want to you know get rid of that thinking and start again um so um at the moment it, it it's as if um once our kids reach adulthood you know like 18 or above mm. the support just drops away completely as, as our kids get older and we and the parents are just left to, to fend for themselves there's absolutely no support for older um autistic people um mm -hmm. And, you know, people wonder why the, 
the life expectancy is much lower than um, neurotypical people. But, you know, when you combine all these things, you know, the lack of support and the, the extra stress on autistic people put on them by society and the lack of support, you know, it's no wonder um, that, that people have much more, many more problems, you know, especially with mental health. Um, right. Yeah, so um, another thing we want to see is um, some support um, into employment, um, which is based on like n the neurodiversity paradigm um, mm -hmm. and a lot better training for em employers um, and mandatory training really for employers. At the moment, the law is really still um giving employers control of the situation you know so they can basically ig ignore a, a disabled person's rights if they if they wish you know and they could ig you know it's it's called reasonable adjustments at the moment um but it's like there's a there's an ambiguity to that word because right. what is what is reasonable you know and <laughs> Who, who decides what is reasonable you know um it's it's the employer um so if if it puts them out too much they're not really going to do it unless they're autistic led themselves right uh, and that goes into you know the way job interviews are, are conducted um it, mm -hmm. it it shuts autistic people out uh because they're looking at your body language uh your eye contact whether you can you know fit in and do all these things um be part of a team um be be part of the you know take part in the office politics that goes on right. you know and that, that, that's just not for a lot of autistic people for most of them i'd say um you know and and it excludes a lot of people and and wastes a lot of potential you know and really we've got to get across to employers that they're doing themselves wrong but you know they're hurting themselves in their own companies because yep. autistic employees are the ones that don't mess around they focus on their work and you know can achieve a lot better things by doing that yep. they just need the we need the adjustments that to the environment um and a little bit more supervision and planning but ultimately it'll reap benefits for the companies um okay so um it's there's also something called solace which is um our charity lead chris is um he has many different roles but he's a university principal lecturer in mm. public health uh, and he's specialized um in autism stigma in his his realm of studies um so he lectures and and trains um a lot of organizations and companies on that um and one of the things he, he invented was is called solace which is um specific um education for parents and carers of autistic children and young people um so it's teaching them about autism acceptance and um pushing back against autism stigma and really it, it, it's it's rooted in the the charities paradigm which is the social model of disability rather than the medical mm -hmm. model yeah. um so um we've we've run a few sessions of that um and um, it's really sort of transformed a lot of families' lives because um, mm -hmm. they've come out of it. Um, it we, we were using Zoom for that before anybody really, it, <laughs> it was really, really popular. You know, people didn't know pre-pandemic, a lot of people, what Zoom was, uh, but we were using it. Um, so um, those sessions, it, I think it's about six or seven six or seven or eight sessions that they have um it's weekly um and 
some some are in person sessions and some are on Zoom. It will be it's led by a specially trained um, professional, um, and uh, at the end of it, parents are a lot better um, informed and geared to. Um, you know, to, to do their caring role um, in a more sensitive uh, way. Um, now another thing, the charity, uh, we knew early on with the charity that we wanted to provide um, mental health support um, for both autistic people and for carers. Uh, and that's what we've basically done at the moment. We've commissioned... Um, a wide range of um, neurodivergent um, professionals in the in mental health and also um, supporting things like um, we've we've got Chloe and um, Annette to support with um, things like uh, learning about autistic identity and also some mental health support. Um, yeah. And we've got. Yeah. Um, some other different neurodivergent um, mental health professionals for, that have different specialties now um, that we can draw upon, which is very, very useful, um, so that um, we're much better prepared to um, to face. Like, there's a whole host of um, problems that people come to us with, um, and we've managed at the moment to fund everything so far with very very little money um so as i said we don't take salaries um and we've we're doing we're still volunteering out our time um oh. on top of doing full-time roles i i'm a full-time carer and chris is oh. got a full full-time job as well um so a, a lot of our um charity's work depends on volunteers wow. um, um, then uh, so looking at the diagram again um, we want there to be changes in the law to protect autistic human rights um, so important <laughs> yeah um, I mean we we've seen a lot of uh, big campaigns you know the last few years, I'm um, thinking of Simi Brown, you know, um, where um, the government was trying to deport him and he, he would have had no support and not been able to um, care for himself. And, and a lot of um, a lot of these cases where autistic human rights are breached you know that there has to be a massive campaign and it depends on you know the whole community making a big effort and and it shouldn't have to happen you know um right. um and you know we're not even safe from um even some of the big charities that are doing some research that they claim is um helpful but when um so i'm thinking of spectrum 10k the national right. national Autistic society when they claimed they were doing helpful research and then um a lot of autistic academics were looking at their ethics around their research and they very quickly saw that there were massive flaws in it um, yeah. and it was basically adding up to eugenics um we were we were the only well, the only charity that I know that supported that um, campaign by the autistic community, the autistic advocacy community, to um, call a halt to that research. Right. Um, um, but we, we again, owe a, a massive debt to the autistic advocates and activists that do this campaigning, and they, they shouldn't have to be doing this. You know, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And so what we need is is the powers that be to listen. 
Yeah. Uh, and that's another area we want the charity to be involved with. Um, uh, and then a final point that I thought of was um, to have an intensive education program from a very young age. Um, so not just for autistic people in schools, but for neurotypical people. Yeah. Uh, because they, you know, they go through life very, very sheltered, um, not knowing anything about autism until it affects their lives, which is not right. how it should be. Right. They think they think that awareness is enough, you know, just to be aware that it exists, which is not enough. No, that's you know. never enough. <laughs> yeah. Can I actually ask you a question about that? Um, yeah. Yeah. Sure. You know how in most grade schools um, there's quote unquote special education, and then there's you know the regular class, right? Yeah. Um, do you have an opinion on the best way to go beyond? that awareness and in, in a sense of like integrating all neurotypes in one classroom? Like, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, the, what the key I think to education is, uh, it, it's, you know, it's, it's not rocket science. I think it's investment of, of funds, you know, and in the right kinds of things that aut the autistic led community would, you know, we we would look at it and say, what do we need to create a classroom like that or a school like that? Um, so there are things called autism provisions uh, within. So that's um, uh, it's sort of a school within a school. Yeah, so mm -hmm. um, where they so they could be a school with a thousand children in it. Um, and within that, there would be. A section of the school um, where a lot of the teaching for autistic pupils is done, but then at some time, sometimes there is some mingling of the of the two populations. Um, yeah. So that's kind of a start. Um, yeah. But really, um, we need to look at for, before we tackle any anything like that. We need to look at um, the massive failings. The education system in England has failed autistic people massively. Um, I think the numbers of excluded autistic children are just, um, they're, dis they're a disgrace, you know, the numbers. I, I think it could be a, quart a quarter or something like that of autistic children are excluded at some wow. point. Um, so, um, you know... The, the money isn't there uh, from government. I, um, this this government um, has been in power now for nearly, I think, 15 years, something like that. Um, and over that time, um, there's been no investment at all in schools. Um, there's just been sort of treading water. And even um, six months into the when they first got in, uh, the last um, government, the previous government bef before they'd got in had enacted, um, I think it was 20 billion pounds of investment in education. Um, so this government uh, went to the high court and tried to stop that from happening. Mm -hmm. So there would have been even less. It was just to pay for the upkeep and the basic infrastructure of the buildings and that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, fortunately, the I think it was the Supreme Court here said the government couldn't do that, and the money had already been committed. There were building projects in place. So those, I think it was uh, schools, new schools that had been started and things like that, all those projects had to go through. But since then, there's been no spending on education. Um, wow. So it's basically been just kept going on a shoestring um even in i've seen it in my son's school um he's in um one of the london boroughs um secondary uh secondary schools for uh special needs 
uh, and you know you can see um, the the building is could could do with a you know a lick of paint and everything else and um, you know the the resources they they would really love new resources you know like he goes and does music therapy and uh, some of the instruments are taped together you know with you know with gaffer tape or something <laughs> you know uh, it's really sad you know and i've heard of a lot worse um situations you know wow. um so yeah the, there needs to be a lot of coming together with um autistic advocates and autistic people and thinking about um what has gone wrong because um you know there there are edu education health and care plans the hcps that um are supposed to be you know the, the right of every autistic child mm. um a lot of the times um parents and families are having to really fight and go to court over those you know about what is in the provision is it just tokenism is it just ticking boxes and not really the help that their children need um mm -hmm. a lot of the times um the schools are just not trained and they're not understanding what a lot of the complex issues are um i had a family that i was helping out um recently and the mum was telling me um she's got several children and um so she the the older child presented in a certain way with adhd and hyperlexia um and her younger child is also presenting in that way mm. but the school doesn't they've got a senko you know who's supposed to know all these things and organize the help but the Senko didn't know what hyperlexia was. So she said, oh, I'll go away and Google it, you know. Um, so really, it's, you know, it's, it's the same story as, as all the other public services, that there needs to be a lot more investment. Um, and then once the money is there and, and if there's a willingness to um, engage with the autistic community about, what changes need to be done and what training needs to be done and if there's autistic input into that training mm -hmm. then, then we can talk about what kind of classroom would look like you know what, what it would look like um i presume i'm thinking you know just off the top of my head it it would be a combination of of having um you know an autism provision where some of the teaching could be done separately uh, because of it is a separate environment and you know a sensory environment um so i think that should should be you know learning should be accessible to the autistic community and if it means um having separate studies for part of the time then so be it um but there should also be um uh going back to what i was talking about um the kind of um, education from a young age of neurotypical people so there should be opportunities for you know social engagement um, you know be between everybody um, and I think um, things like um, Damien Milton's double empathy problem should be you know taught to teachers because they're yeah. not aware, they're not aware of it um, you know, um, simply put, um, so professionals um, before Damien Milton was, were looking only at um, the interactions of autistic people and neurotypical people, and they were saying, well, clearly autistic people can't communicate you know um what and we need to teach them how and we need to teach them our way of doing it 
and they were kind of forcing this on the autistic community which is proven very very harmful um yeah very so, harmful. so you know but but damien milton said when when you look at um the way two autistic people communicate there's a lot less problems between it um we understand we all have a similar way of communicating where um we will talk about um you know what is safe for us our our interests and that kind of thing um we will sort of give each other a lot more respect yeah um in the way we communicate um we won't use things that are not meaningful like small talk and we won't insist on um you know the the physical side of things which is you know the eye contact and that kind of thing yeah. um and and that needs to be taught there needs to be an a, a a big awareness of that with young young neurotypical people yeah so that um and, and then i think a lot of the problems in schools will start to improve like bullying you know this yeah. kind of thing oh yeah definitely Right. um so um <laughs> so with those things uh this diagram is like we are putting those things in in injecting them into society and then seeing what happens mm -hmm. so um but in order to do that we needed to build a charity from the ground up so um this is basically how to do that how, how we've gone about doing that um so it's basically um things like advertising getting the word out how how are we going to do that so we're going to do public speaking and campaigning um advertising on social media and uh, marketing and branding and maybe reaching out to social media influencers and things like that um, another key thing is to team up with other autistic led um, organizations which we are doing um and i think that's going to be a key factor going forward um there's a lot of um small autistic led um community interest companies that are forming and uh, which so, you know we've come along at the same time and sort of independent from each other but when you look at our goals they're surprisingly and shockingly similar um you know um i was looking at one in uh the manchester area yesterday online and i sort of said well we have to have a zoom with them um because it's almost identical to the one the stuff that we've written you know is on is on the website uh, which is which is great to see um we also spoke with um uh, a lady uh Brid bridget mcgrath from um the midlands who's mm -hmm. started a cic um called bright fire um she's an art therapist and um she's also um one of our allies now we've spoken to her so we want to encourage you know these small organizations all over the country that's starting up um and i th i think one of the things we've learned is that the it's very much going to be a grassroots mm -hmm. effort by the whole autistic community yep. um so um and another thing we want to do is um we want to recruit young autistic people um and that's kind of um factored into our plans where we plan to approach job centers and to um get some young autistic people to volunteer for us and in return um 
they'll get work experience and they'll get um, access to um, a lot of the adjustments that they need. Mm. Um, and, and hopefully, um, we're hoping to be able to um, signpost them wherever possible to, Beth, you know, to employment opportunities where we can. Um, so a lot of our work is also based on on the local community and, and volunteers. Um, so um, one of the other things we do is we have monthly uh, drop-in sessions at mm. four sites around London. It will soon become more than more than that, um, where um, it's only two hour monthly sessions um, where we hire somewhere like a church hall or a community center. Um, and we just invite everybody in from the autistic community that wants to come. Mm. Uh, and because what we had seen before was um, other charities and organizations that did, did this had, had any kind of social group or support group, um had all these kind of barriers to access where you know they require an autism diagnosis or they require you to be from a certain age group um and we've just got rid of all of that um and we thought there was some reason for this like maybe health and safety with adults and children mixing together but we've just found that not to be the case and it's been um fantastic you know amazing. There is response um yeah. and, and the kind of results that we've got um so um there's been a real uptake and we um very very quickly we've only we've only been doing them for a year um wow. so really only only 12 sessions um from the first one and we've had a you know a, a real um rush of people um and certainly I, I think um since lockdown there's been a real drop in in the number of um in-person meetings uh big simply because i think the big charities are trying to save money sure. on these you know um and and we do have to rent the sites but we've found ways to do that um so again sort of we're st <laughs> we're funding things and and the big and we haven't got money but the big charities have got hundreds of millions right. and they're not so <laughs> 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 doesn't make sense but there we are um yeah so um and some other things we want to do is to train the media so that the way they they report about autism is completely different they you know <laughs> yeah it's it's just um not at all help helpful to uh do what they're doing no. uh, i yeah. i just read on um i forget what it's called something like diversity directory or something along those lines and you know i had all these uh conditions listed you know and how to as a journalist talk about these things and i had to stop myself from reading half of the definition for autism adhd like i couldn't my my, my system activated <laughs> just yeah. like, this yeah. is not this is not how we do it please yeah. stop <laughs> please yeah. stop um, so i i'm really grateful that this is a part of your plan because it's not just you know the people in schools and doctors and things like the media actually has a really large role in how we perceive autistics and um especially when you know when we have those tragic cases reported of police getting involved um like we, we need to stop stigmatizing and pathologizing and actually see autistic humans for what we are autistic humans you know like we, we don't need to separate out the autism we don't need to demonize us for having quote unquote having autism like can we just yeah. uh, anyway so this this really 
I'm, I'm excited. This is awesome so far. Thank you for um, presenting. Okay. Um, so one of the things um, that uh, Chris, our charity lead, has done, um, he, his cultural background is uh, Greek Cypriot, and his um, area of London, Southgate, has a large um, Greek Cypriot community there. Um, so um, his, um, a lot of his sort of area of expertise is around autism stigma and mm. what, so what the charity wants to do um, because of that is to push back against stigma and to educate people. Um, and so he has had an idea to focus on minority groups that maybe um, the, you know, the education around autism just isn't really there at all, you know. Yeah. Um, so it, it's sort of even a, a bit further behind the rest of, of society. Um, and uh, he um, has reached out to the Greek um, uh, Ra London radio and um, he's now doing, um, with some of our volunteers, he does a radio show on there. Um, and he sort of gently um, edu educating the uh, Greek Cypriot community of London. Um, they get um, quite a large listenership. I think it was between 200 and 300,000 listeners wow. for each episode um that's amazing uh, so that's one area where we're kind of educating and and we're we've sort of reached out to local media um and we have our own podcast for the charity which we've been doing since um since we started really because wow. that's a, a very um low low cost thing yeah. where we can just invest our time um and we've been uh, trying to um speak, speak we've been speaking to a lot of autistic advocates and trying to you know spread the word and, and publicize them mm -hmm. um, which is which has been good um um so i've talked to you about the support for carers that we've um we've had some of those sessions put in place now um and that also encapsulates um the drop-in community um cafes that we have where mm. carers are welcome as as well as autistic people um and often um you know it it makes carers think about themselves and and sometimes they do you know end up uh, saying, well, do I need to go for a diagnosis or, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. The same uh, same situation as, as what I did, really. Right. Um, but it helps um, them understand their children better and yeah. um, how to care for them, you know. Um, we talked a little bit before about human rights. Um, so again, um, let's have a look. And training in public services. Um, I've talked about that. Um, and training for companies as well. Yep. Um, and for schools and universities. Um, I feel like universities are, for some reason, might be like some of the hardest places to get people to shift. I don't know. Um, yeah, we we did have um, some discussion with a big university, um, and they were the, the person was was quite high up they you know they were they were sort of all in and they wanted us to train all their staff 
But when it came to the funding issue, I think there was a problem and then we didn't hear again about it. So, you know, yeah. they're always welcome to come back to us. Um, the, the package that we put together was was very, very generous on our our side. We were we looked at the. Um, the other uh, training packages around and then we we have we halved the price. So we were doing it at half price anyway, um, right. you know, when compared to other people. And I, and I don't think they were autistic led, the other people, you know. No. Um, that, is, so. that is the frustrating part, right? There are all these people out there educating on our experience who aren't actually autistic themselves and charging a lot of money to do it. Yeah, absolutely. And then the people like us who are out here trying to, you know, actually teach on our experience, like the actual autistic experience, and um, it's 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 just looked down on, or they don't bite because it's the same amount of money if or less than what other people are charging. Like it doesn't it doesn't compute in my brain. I'm still trying to wrap my head around how and why that happens. I don't yeah. know. Anyway. I, again, um, I think um, throughout this whole process, I think we've learned that we have to be very, very patient. And we 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 end up with doing what seem like a lot of small things every day. Then at the end of the year, I'll add them up and because I have to write a charity newsletter about what we've done. Right. And all these small things add up into something huge, you know, and I think, wow, did we really do all that in just a year? <laughs> you know, and, and there's only a handful of us and we're not being paid, you know. Um, so it's like oh. amazing. Uh, but, um, you know, we, we have to think of it in, in the context of, you know, using the tools that we have. Um yeah and not be too harsh on ourselves and and we can't rush because if we rush it if we rush anything we do we're not going to get um a quality outcome right we we are not going to get the outcome that we want and we have to we have to just pause and really think about you know making the best outcome possible and if it takes 10 years then we'll take 10 years to do it you know um but otherwise things are just not going to happen. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, so we, we've got various volunteers doing various things. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so some people have, um, on our behalf, tried to get various things for us, but, and, and, and you end up speaking to, you know, the people in power um in powerful positions um and no it can be very frustrating and you have to kind of bite your tongue and not not say what you're thinking to them because yep. you know it, it's just not helpful to to shout at someone or something like that you know <laughs> um because you're just going to alienate them you know so um we we've learned to be patient and and try and um despite our time and, and seize the opportunities when they arise and they, they do arise, you know, but we have to be patient to try and pick and choose the opportunities that come up. Yep. Um, yeah. So, um, so basically to summarize this, um, we've, we're basically getting to the stage that we're kind of at now where we've put all these things into the community. We're doing some of them, not all of them. We're doing as much as we can. And then um, as we get funding into the charity, we will, um, we're employing our first two uh, autistic volunteers who are uh, paid part-time mm. at the moment. That's what we can afford at the moment. Um, and they're going to, do some of these things but as we get more funding then we'll put more uh employ more people you know to do them um right. so um as as we sort of move up the pyramid here um 
it sort of shows the effect of what the effects of um our our charity's work will be um so it's basically that the training's being delivered um so some support for autistic people is being put in place uh, so we have a befriending service um at the moment we're really struggling to kind of do that because there's so many people apply for our befriending service where um we will match a volunteer um with an autistic person that feels for you know th there's a lot of loneliness out there yeah um and social isolation uh we we started this over lockdown um and it was extremely popular then um and oh. um the kind of dilemma we find ourselves in though is um volunteers are very very rare um mm. and like a precious thing that come along um and you know we're not really a known charity we haven't got money to advertise and things like this right. um and um even if we did the big charities um you know they, they'll pay a fortune to advertise and right. drown drown out the competition the ones, so, yeah. so um um the volunteers that we do get um are, are kind of swallowed up you know by the demand um so there is quite a, a big waiting time um with the befriending um because it does um it it's not a thing where you can go back to a volunteer and say i've got another person um do you want to help them as well because it's an it's an ongoing support right. that, that will that will go on and build into hopefully build into some kind of friendship or relationship you know where um we've we've had some great feedback where um people have it starts off often with text messaging um just like you know just so that someone can feel like they're not alone they they can reach out if they like there's someone on the end of the phone or or on an email um and then um you know someone to talk about their day or or whatever they want to talk about and to get some some support from mm. um but often um it it may you know progress after months and months where they they want to you know have have a a meet up and there's been some great friendships formed out of it um but That's because great. because of this kind of the the kind of ongoing role um where they're only able to support like one or maybe a max two people from it um because it's you know it's not a paid thing that people are doing it in their spare time um right. and often um the best befrienders are autistic people themselves um so um because of that there, there's um still not not enough um volunteers for it um and i think another thing is um which really frustrates me um you know we we are the people that don't have the funding to do things and then um so a lot of the big charities um they will contact us and they will say um we've seen you have a befriending scheme can we refer people to you you know and they're sitting there with hundreds of millions of pounds every year but they they won't do it you know right um or um another another one is uh, gp surgeries um they will get you know contact people in need there and they will try and refer to us um that's okay um if we had the capacity to do do a lot of these things but um at the rate they you know i don't know how many gp surgeries there are in london but there seems to be hundreds of messages you know every month yeah. and we just can't support hundreds of people a month you know right. at the moment so um we're having to be sort of patient and not not get frustrated with it but yeah. uh we're sort of committed to making these things work and we're trying to strategize maybe we're going to have um some zoom groups for people that are waiting and things like that where we can uh manage to support a lot more people quicker you know um 
that way so that people are not left isolated but we're having to be imaginative about how we deal with these things um and again the other bigger players out there are not helping us <laughs> so, right. um yeah so this is talking about kind of the the pro if when when progress is going to be made so yeah we, we've got our drop-in um community cafe centers um and hopefully uh, we're aiming to be in like every borough eventually you know i think there are over 30 boroughs in london uh, and then in the surrounding counties there's even more areas that need need these um in-person meetups for yeah. the whole community so um that will take a while but we're happy with the progress we've made there um, um and then uh this is just detailing like um what progress the stages of progress in it in all of the things that we've put in so in education um employment and all these areas that we talked about um and then um as things get get achieved over the years yeah we're talking about the advocacy and the rights the public services getting trained the end of autism stigma uh, and that's when we you know i think i thought about i saw a live with um chloe and annette where they were talking about um autopia and the mm -hmm. perfect world for autistic people and i thought this is is a parallel yeah thing that, that i've kind of done with this because we're talking about our ultimate goals um for the autistic community right so, and, and and we're talking about um what i call a life cycle of support so you know you think about a butterfly from when it's an egg to a caterpillar to a butterfly it's yeah. a cycle and and it's the same with human beings you know at the moment um there's a very disproportionate amount of support that uh, children are getting some support and then it gets less and less and less as you get older where really it needs to get more and more in but in the ways that autistic people want um, and that's going to take some time and some training and some understanding um, at the top before we get any progress on that yeah. um, I just I love how comprehensive this is. You've really uh, looked at all the all the angles, you know. <laughs> well, as I as I said at the beginning, um, disclaimer: I'm not a professional. <laughs> yeah, I'm only <laughs> I'm only uh, autistic, you know, but lived experience and all that, you know. So I've I've seen what the kind of problems that come up in from the community yeah. um, I, by you know by trying to serve the community i've dealt with all these problems first of all in the facebook group and then um i deal with all the emails that come in at the moment through the charity and try to direct people to help try to help people if we can or right. try, try and sign post people to other help um well, definitely don't want to discount any of that because i think that's genuinely why this is all so comprehensive <laughs> you know that expert okay. or not that's that, i don't know if that language is really needed it's that you've done it and here it is and that's wonderful it's really nice to hear you say that because <laughs> um, i was kind of worried if i've left anything out but we can we can always go back and make an even more detailed plan but i, <laughs> I, I kind of think we've got our hands full you know um i so, think this is a good start to say the least <laughs> yeah maybe in, in 100 years we'll go back and um when yeah. this is, is done <laughs> and we'll see see what else is needed um and then kind of i think it boils down to these things here that um the ultimate ultimate goals so autistic human rights are guaranteed and protected in law which they're not at the moment right. um the charity is implementing autistic led strategies to improve and support the lives of autistic people and carers um that is about 
getting us properly funded to the level of, you know, someone like the National Autistic Society. And at the moment, we're sort of um, a lot of um, because a lot of small charities like this, autistic led charities and CIC start as grassroots um, small organizations. We're kind of um, at, held at gunpoint by um, charities that are not autistic led or right. sources, sources of funding uh, that don't have our expertise and right. put, put demands on us. Um, and we need to be independent of that and to form our own, Absolutely. you know, fi find our own path and, and achieve these things on our own. Yeah. Um, so, um, another of, of the final outcomes will be, um, yeah, the charities activities are funded by business grants and the public, uh, and the kind of autopia conclusion is um, sustainable measures are in place to meet the needs mm -hmm. of the autistic community autistic people live longer happier and healthier lives yes <laughs> um, so hopefully I can stop sharing that now. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for walking us through that. That was really wonderful. Um, and I'm so encouraged that there are, you know, folks such as yourself who are doing the grassroots um, work that needs to be done, even amongst the chaos of, you know, being a parent and working a full time job and all these amazing things. Um, like we really like I'm, I want to just like <laughs> give you a standing ovation right now because we, we need you. Um, Chris here says James deserves an OBE or something familiar. Mm -hmm. He genuinely works every single day on supporting the community on a complete, completely voluntary basis, which being a full-time care and single dad. So we're just echoing the same thing. Like, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> um, truly thank you. Uh, our community oh. is better for it. I have to, I have to say, I, I couldn't do it without Chris either. He, yeah. he sort of, he, uh you know compliments me a lot in public and everything uh but um i think he deserves the credit as well because um Absolutely. i think we just work together really really well um so we've got different skill sets and um so uh and where uh i could be talking to someone for instance at a community cafe or on a uh if if we're talking to someone on zoom um and because of my adhd i might you know get um exhausted you know and i won't be able to continue what i'm saying he will immediately sort of step in he's got like this um telepathy link with me because <laughs> we work so closely a lot of the time um so I, I think without him and, and his vision as well, we, we just couldn't do it. But um, we sort of need to build our team and, and we are, you know, we're getting some, some good volunteers coming through. Um, so we need that to, to continue happening. Um, and, uh, you know, that yeah, will well, enable, enable things to change quicker. Right. Hopefully our live today will get some, some folks' attention over over in your neck of the woods over you know across the pond for me um because that who knows like someone could be watching and be like oh i can volunteer um because it sounds like you definitely need folk to rally with you and um be a part of the organization so i yeah i i wish you all the best um and thank you chris as well uh, who just commented um for all the work that you do and um, you know go ahead Okay, um, I just wanted to ask you, um, so what is the situation like uh, in, you're in America, yeah? I am, so, yeah. Because um, I am sometimes contacted by, you know, American autistic advocates, they look at the charity website, they're saying, what is the equivalent in America? Ah. Um, so, you know, 
it, say say um i don't know if we if we if we got funding here um and and say in x number of years we covered the whole of london then we would be ex wanting to expand right. the, mod the model and say to other cities in the uk why don't you you know partner with us and come you know we can do the same thing in your city and then we could cover more areas like that so are there autistic advocates in america that are planning to do the same thing so from what i've seen recently um we have too many organizations um that are like autism speaks um yeah. we have too many that are you know aba forward and wanting to change autistic children we definitely do not have the adult support either you know you know what you were listing for like the full cycle of life we need it here too um there's very few organizations that provide for all ages and very few even more so that are centered on the autistic lived experience and actually um embrace and celebrate and value who we are just as we are um so we definitely need big players to shift things and and change that i um you see my queer culture coaching i am working on my own advocacy um, programs kind of like what you listed um in the sense of educating professionals so i want to go into um, medical spaces i want to go into uh, education spaces and the majority of it though i really want to focus on corporate world um where I think it's like what between 30 and 40% of uh, neurodivergent specific to like autistic individuals are unemployed um, or underemployed. Like this is an outrageous number of people that do not have proper, proper jobs um, because they're not valued in the same way as neurotypicals and we're not accommodated for in those spaces. So I, I, ideally want to be teaming up with people okay. who are doing that you know yeah um, <laughs> well I, i'd like to respond um first of all um we have similar like really low figures here for autistic people in employment um all i would say to that is it seems to me from the you know the feeling that i'm getting by the the number of people we're supporting uh with mental health and things like that mm -hmm. um the number of people that are having late diagnosis um i think there's a lar much larger number of people or neurodivergent people that are oh. in employment but yes. they are not diagnosed and they, they are, are you know right. they're struggling through every day their quality yep. of life is is you know terrible you know yep. but they're just getting by uh by masking and all the rest of it um and um you know that that needs to be dealt with um so that people's mental health improves and then the quality of right. life improves um um for your other point um i would at some point love to be involved with or just encourage you to <laughs> try and connect with other autistic advocates you know yeah. um and eventually form your own grassroots yeah that's that's um, the goal that's the goal i like even, we have a lot of like public figures mm -hmm. on facebook at least yeah, that are doing yeah. amazing things in the united states um yeah. there's a good handful um and i i've been trying to connect and network um so we're at least in that way there are people that are doing amazing things and speaking to thousands of people at a time right. online, which is, you know, one of the big steps that we need to take. Um, so I, I won't erase that, but I will say as far as like brick and mortar, like physical businesses and people like organizations, charities, services. Um, well, I think what we've proved is that we don't, you don't really need a lot of money or, right. or, um, or it to be this massive, um you know our community cafe events they're only uh two hour sessions every month you know it's not a it's not a big deal it shouldn't yeah. be a big deal you know yeah. but but people treat it as if it's gold and right. you know 
that um, we don't even advertise. Uh, we just put it on our charity Facebook page. Wow. Um, you know, we, we can't really afford to advertise. So we're only just getting around to... Um, we're getting to know that um, so, some... Um, we contacted like the local MP who's like the local politician in that area. Mm -hmm. And they do sort of, two of them have come to the launch of the latest community cafes and that has had a big effect. Wow. So they have um, put things in the local newspaper for us okay. um, and, and things have grown a lot faster from that. But even if we don't advertise things will still grow and, and word of mouth spreads it, you know, and, People will still come. So yeah. Um just just by doing 12 sessions over a year, we've now got about 50 to 100 people that come to our Southgate wow. group, you know, which is great because we haven't really advertised that very much at all. Um, just on our Facebook and our social media. Um, and we've got a lot of local support from um local families have approached businesses and they've mm -hmm donated food for the you know so we can give refreshments for people yeah. um and we've really been surprised i think um the the first place we we contacted was a church hall so um chris, chris was on the phone to to them he said um you know we're london also awesome group charity a lady on the other end said ah oh, i've got an autistic son um then um one of the people uh, that runs the church um, that looks after the maintenance was there um, at the first session. He said, oh, I'm just going to go going for a diagnosis for myself. My son is diagnosed, you know, so immediately straight away, two of the people from the church were autistic. Um, wow. So I think there's a lot more people out there that, that we know and that it's, it's just not publicized very well, you know. Right. Yeah. by the media um, or in the right ways. Um, even if it was some kind of small event, I think you have to start somewhere and then you'll right. be, I think you'll be surprised at the response you get. And I think um, because the demand is so high for, you know, any kind of support. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so maybe look at um, what, uh, you know, there's a Facebook group started by um, Autistic Advocates um, by um, Emma Dalmain and John Greeley, who who are like international autistic advocates. Um, it's oh, called God. it's called um, Autism Inclusivity. Oh, OK. Um, yeah. And when they started, they started from no members. Um, they've only been going, I think, two or three years and they've got. I think over 150,000 now. Their their goal was to have autistic people educate parents of autistics, right. uh, and I think certainly in the UK we've seen a, a lot of parents turning away from things like ABA. Yep. They're a lot more aware now um, that is harmful to mental health, and I think we can credit that Facebook group for a lot of that awareness um, that. That, that sort of started getting the message out and now it's sort of spreading around by word of mouth. Um, but um, something like that, if you look at their goals and then maybe replicating that, yeah, like some, something like just, that. just maybe start some events. It doesn't have to be, they can get more and more regular as you figure out where the communities are that you'll yeah. get, you know Definitely. people coming um you know may, maybe do some speaking events with other advocates and see how that goes and then maybe you can build up something from there um but i but i'd, I'd love to kind of hear back from you and, yeah uh, maybe con connect from that now and then and, and see how it's going because um i do get these um they're sort of young autistic people that say oh where can i become part of the advocacy movement and i'm Sort of have to say well it's not there yet unfortunately Cause, you know because we're very small over here it, it's hard for us to visualize how big one state in america is compared you know you could fit the whole country here a hundred times into one of your states easily yeah, yeah. um but 
um, the people must be out there. You, you've just got to connect to them. You oh, know? definitely. Yeah. No, I, I yeah, <laughs> I have a lot of spinning plates, so I'm trying to figure out, you know, yeah, I know, I know, where I know. to direct. That's, that's <laughs> kind of describes my life. Yeah. yeah. But no, thank you. Um, thank you so much for sharing your insight. Yes. And uh, I would love to stay connected as well. Um, moving forward. So definitely we'll be reaching out, but um, I just want to thank you for your time today. And uh, thank you for walking us through that amazing blueprint of a plan. Um, what do you call it? The, the trans, hang on, I have it. The theory of change, theory of change. Yeah. Um, absolutely brilliant. And uh, really appreciate your organization. This is the trustee of London autism group charity, just to name that again, for everyone who's watching. Um, I, you know, visit their website, see how you can support, or if you need support, you know, there's, I'm sure plenty of, you just saw all the things that they're doing. So, <laughs> um, inquire yeah, there. We're starting um, them. We're starting to do it. Um, starting to do, yeah. <laughs> uh, I just like to say, um, it's an honor being on here. Um, I don't know if I've educated anybody, but, um, I've, I've liked sharing, uh, no. talking, and talking about what we're doing. So, um, yeah, that's thank you. Funny so enough. Much. Thank yeah, you so absolutely. Much. It's been a pleasure hosting you. So thank you for being here. Um, the way we like to end our chats um, is to name a favorite stim of yours recently, and um, also your favorite form of potato. <laughs> what do you mean by potato? Like any any kind of potato that you like to eat or you know, befriend if you're talking about Ben here, because <laughs> he likes to be a potato. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, oh, I don't know the name of it. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think it's called Bartlett something. If, if you, Bartlett. So, there's some kind of, it's, it's like um, a sort of organic upmarket type of potato huh. that's around yeah. here and uh, this sort of... oh you mean like the actual kind of potato so not like the oh, yeah. form that you eat it in like mashed potatoes french oh, fries okay no no i'm thinking about uh, sorry i'm i'm very literal thinking so i'm <laughs> no, that's thinking great. Uh, that was the, a great answer what kind of company <laughs> yeah <laughs> company name uh branding you know uh yeah <laughs> My literal brain again. Um, <laughs> so good. Um, so somebody today actually was talking to me about um, they were having a complicated journey. They come came down to the city and they're from the countryside. They talk about they were talking about um, you know um, the underground train system. We call it the tube mm -hmm. system. We so they were talking about. Uh, knitting the tube knitting the tube system or knit, knitting the railways and i was thinking what are they talking about they they into wool and knitting and what <laughs> and then they're saying no it's because they're so complicated the uh the railways that they have to knit their way through it oh you know, so my see, little I, brain I, my I brain was, went to the yeah, the knitting like i was thinking craft. about yeah Absolutely. i was thinking about craft as well so i, I sent them a picture of a knitted train someone has done online on google <laughs> images and they were saying no <laughs> so that kind of thing uh so it. uh type of potato okay uh roast potato for me and mashed potato for my son hey uh, very good who's who's actually asleep now which is very nice <laughs> so i should come on here every night and he'll get him to sleep <laughs> he just probably <laughs> likes my voice talking oh that's so sweet yeah, yeah. happy to help <laughs> <laughs> all right well oh and did you uh do you have a favorite stim lately that you like to do uh the repetition thing that i was repetition, talking yeah. about i think that kind of counts um so uh, yeah i think i do that with a lot of different things sure. um uh with music with all kinds of things um and i think looking back now i've i've done that for so many years <laughs> i think it <laughs> saved my life you know a lot of times when i was younger yeah. and i Absolutely. didn't even know didn't know what i was doing but but 
we just do what we, what we feel is natural, don't we? Mm -hmm. so. That's all we need. Absolutely. All right, James. Well, uh, thank you again. And thank you everyone who's tuned in or who's going to tune in later after we're done. So pleasure to have you all. And uh, we'll see you next time here on Academy. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye.